Okay. Um, this was something we were going over in men's Sunday school when Pastor Bob asked me to share it tonight. And it evolves around um, a baseball team Jacob played on. Uh, Jacob plays a fall baseball program, and uh, their season just ended. But it was something that happened in, because of his coaches and what they are and who they are. And what the situation is, they play in a North Charleston City Rec League, and his coaches are all Christian coaches. So what they try to do is instill into these boys some moral and character and principles that God teaches in His Word. And you know, a lot of people are fearful to even do that in a public recreation department or anything to do with public place. But they're not. And here's what happened. Uh, Jacob is 10, and this is a 11 and 12 year old league his team was young not as experienced all the other teams were bigger and they had only lost no they had won one game and tied one other one and lost every other game but there was a mid-season championship tournament coming up and God spoke to me about this Those coaches teaching these kids God's principle. And I'm just going to read these to you, and I'm going to put them on the board in a minute, but these kids were given an assignment. Every week you come to practice, you're going to bring the word of the week, and you're going to bring an example of how you applied it. And they were responsibility, respect, good deeds, perseverance, Integrity and leadership. And what's that got to do with a baseball team? It's got everything to do with a baseball team. It's got everything to do with an individual. It's got everything to do with me and you and those boys. So again, these coaches applying God's principle to these kids. Not beating them over the head with a Bible, but just taking these principles right out of the Word and showing them, here Here's how you apply these. Now here they have a losing, abysmal season. It's just awful. They come into this tournament. I looked at the coach. I said, they're going to win this tournament. And the coach did a 180. Yeah, yeah, well, we'll play. <laughs> we'll do our best. The athletic director of the ball field, childhood friend of mine, he knows when I say something, I mean it. Mike, this team is going to win this tournament. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Whatever. What they got in this tournament, they beat every team that had beaten them badly during the season. Played excellent. Went on and won the midseason championship, and everyone was <laughs> awestruck. But God, and what he did is, let me show honor to these coaches and this team. These coaches are teaching these kids my principle. Let me show them what I can do. When you think everything is down and out, let me show you what I can do. And let me show you how I can show honor because you're abiding in what I tell you to do. And that, there's no other way to explain it. You can't say they're the best team. They were not. You can't say, well, you know, they perform okay. No, they were losing all the time. It was not an explainable thing other than God honored that coaching staff and those boys. Now, here's what happened in the midst of it. Beginning of the season, she's very direct. Boys, you're going to be respectful here. You're not going to throw your equipment around. Your parents pay hard-earned money. You're going to respect your equipment. When we're talking, you zip it. Very direct and stern, but very caring and loving to these kids. Teaching them good principles and morals. So she goes through, and the other coaches back all this up, and they, they teach them, you know, we're going to be responsible. 
Just these, you know, these things that they talked about. One of the rules of the, of the uh, league was if you played fall ball, you couldn't play another type of league that was a, uh, a travel ball team. Well, one of the boys on our team who was one of the better players, and listen to this now, he missed the championship weekend. But let me tell you why. His mother and him both lied to our coach, and he went and played a weekend of travel ball. Now, get this now. Had he played that weekend, it would have been disqualified. Because our coach found out she would have went herself and said, I've got to bring this to your attention. So since he didn't play, they didn't get disqualified. The championship holds up. But she has to walk up and tell these boys the next time they came together, this young man will not play on the team anymore. And here's why. The rules were made very clear, and he didn't hold up any end of his bargain on responsibility, integrity, and his mother didn't either. He wasn't involved in the glory that God gave him that weekend for that championship series. Because God's not going to reward that. But since he was out of the picture, the reward came. His lack of integrity on his half and his mother's, he missed out on the glory. Something they thought was so minor, they missed out on the glory. Well, we probably won't win you anyway. I'll go do what I want to do. Missed out. Missed out. Do you get that? How, boy. You mean if I don't do what I'm supposed to do, there's a blessing I'm going to miss out on. Powerful. Well, if you'll put it on the board. So it hit me to bring this up, and, and, and I thought, you know, these boys are learning it at 10, 11, and 12, but it's a good refresher for all of us. And the first one they had to do was Responsibility. Taking care of your duties. You know, on the field, they had to know what position they were playing. What are the duties involved? What do I have to be responsible for? i got to be at practice on time. Parents, you have a responsibility to have your children here. Everyone's got the responsibility. Taking care of your duties. And go ahead and pull up Genesis 3.12. Don't. Do do Very simple, not complicated. Genesis 3.12. And the man said, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree and I ate. <laughs> what did he do? He did not take up his responsibility. Adam's first response when confronted by God was, someone else made me do it. Look how big that lack of responsibility ended up being. Man. Not only did you do what I told you not to do, then you confronted me with a lie about it. Because when you don't take responsibility, that's a lie. He just, woo, I'm skipping out on this responsibility. Matthew 27, 24. So when Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but rather than a riot was about to break out, he took water and washed his hands in the presence of the crowd saying, I am not guilty of no or responsible for this righteous man's blood. See to it yourself. That's the buck. That's the buck. So in attempting to avoid his own responsibility, Jesus went to the cross. 
How big is the, the consequence of you not taking up your responsibility? You may think it's minor or, hey, if I don't take up the responsibility, then I'm out of it. Uh-uh. <laughs> no, it's coming back on you. It's coming back on you. So responsibility, responsibility. Numbers 151, Willie. See, that young boy's parent wasn't responsible. She didn't take it serious. They gave their word and was lying about their word the whole time. So it was null and void. And put that whole team in jeopardy. When the tabernacle is to go forward, the Levites shall take it down and when the tabernacle is to be pitched, the Levites shall set it up. And the excluded, any knot of the tribe of Levi who approach the tabernacle shall be put to death. That's basically just saying, some of your responsibilities seem boring or monotonous or pff, does it really matter? Does it really matter? But it's important to God to fulfill them wholeheartedly. So however small they may seem or monotonous or if I don't do this, it's not going to affect or hurt anybody. Lie. Everything you do has an effect on somebody. Get this, kids. Everything you do will affect somebody. You will not escape that principle. The next one is respect. Respect. Treating someone or something with kindness and care. Just like the coach said, don't be throwing your equipment around. Your parents work hard to supply these things for you. When the coaches are talking, don't talk. Be obedient. Teaching them respect. Teaching them how to be mannerly. Not a bunch of punk thugs. Amen. That's what we get. That's what we get when you don't teach them about what's respect and what respect really means. Let's pull up Matthew 7 and Matthew 7 12. So then, whatever you desire that others would do to and for you, even do also to and for them. For this is, and sums up, the law and the prophets. Simple. <laughs> you want some respect? You want to be treated good? Watch how you're treating others. Romans 2.10. But glory and honor and heart peace shall be awarded to everyone who habitually does good. The Jew first and also the Greek. Glory and honor. That team got some of God's glory and honor by being obedient and doing these principles. The young man who dishonored him didn't, didn't get to partake in that glory. So we gain respect in much the same way we show it. Building our lives on God's word. Treating others the way we would like to be treated. And here you go. Not compromising our character and standing up for truth no matter what. I'm going to repeat that last part again. Not compromising our character and standing up for truth no matter what. Most people think of that in big terms, but small terms matter. That championship weekend mattered to that team, and that boy showed no concern for it. His mother showed no concern for it. They got caught up in what they wanted. Showed no concern for it. But again, they compromised their character. And our coach, 
was going to stand up for the truth she found out about it, no matter what. I'm going to let the league know what happened, and if we forfeit the championship, so be it. That was the answer. But that's not what happened, because God held and honored their stand. James 2, 1 through 3. My brethren, pay no servile regard to people. Show no prejudice, no partiality. Do not attempt to hold and practice the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, together with snobbery. Snobbery. <laughs> Respect involves showing more concern for people than agendas. Thinking highly of others, building them up in love, and treating everyone with fairness and integrity. True respect. See, a lot of people get caught up in these agendas. And if people see me going and fulfilling this agenda, I'll earn their respect. A lot of people have taken very long falls over trying to fulfill agendas and walking right over the people they're trying to help. So blinded by the agenda, they forget the people they're walking on. They think they're gaining respect and they're losing all respect in the process. Don't pay so much attention to the agenda. The next on the young men's list was good deeds. Good deeds, showing kindness without expecting anything in return. That's hard, people. We all battle with that. Showing kindness without expecting anything in return. That goes against the grain of, well, if I do this, well, then maybe they will do this for me. It's a wrong motive. You know, if I show them how good I am in this, then maybe they'll let me do that. Wrong motive. I'll help my neighbor, and then when I want to borrow his boat, he'll be obliged to let me borrow it. Wrong motive. Get you nowhere. 1 Timothy 5.10, Willie. And she must have a reputation for good deeds as one who has brought up children, who has practiced hospitality to strangers of the brotherhood, washed the feet of the saints, helped to relieve the distressed, and devoted herself diligently to do good in every way. That's powerful. Kind deeds are marks of goodness. And then that brings respect of others. Just be kind. Be kind. You want to do something? Do something good. Why would you rather do something bad when you can do something good? And don't have a motive or an agenda behind the good deed. Just do the good deed. You know, when I cut my grass, I cut my neighbor's side on both sides. I don't stand out there afterwards and go, hey, you see what I did? You see what I did? I took Joshua out there. I want to teach him the principle. Our neighbor, they went through a divorce. The husband's not there. She's there with two kids. They uh, had a, we had a bad rain and a flood and all the debris washed up in the driveway. So I took my son out there with our, our hose and washed all that gunk out of there. And never once did he ask me, what's the reward? And if he would have, I would have told him, her driveway will be clean. Be the reward. But he, I think he already knew the principle. 
Son, her husband's not here. We're men. We got to be responsible enough to go over here and help her. With nothing expected in return. And again, we didn't wait till she got home. Can't wait till she sees what we did. Yeah. I mean, boy, she, boy, she's gonna have to, you know, you know, cook us a steak or something. Nope. Just cleaned it out. Let it be. The next one on their list was perseverance. Spencer, you should have got that for me. (laughs) Perseverance. Dedicated. Never giving up. Dedicated. I will not give up. I had a great example in perseverance in watching my dad. My dad is from Pastor Bob's generation, and he just, son, if you got a job to do, get up and just go do it. Son, don't give up. You'll finish it and get it done. He just instilled perseverance in me because not only was he telling me to do it, but I saw the example he showed in his perseverance. Joshua 6.3 on that, Willie. Listen, people. You're going to march around this city. All the men of war going around the city once. And you're going to do it for six days. Man, I can't stroke half a day out of this thing. This is crazy. No, he taught them perseverance. You do it for six days. Six days. Perseverance is obeying even when God's way doesn't seem to make sense or produce results. See, God knew the result if they were obedient. But boy, day one, with day two... How do you know, day three, there's some people ready to go on home, right? This ain't getting nowhere. This is crazy. Boy, is this ever going to get over with? Day five and a half, man, come on. I mean, where's the promise? I don't see no results. But you have to persevere. You have to keep on. You got to put up the fight. 2 Corinthians 8, 10, and 11, Willie. It is, then my, it is then my counsel and my opinion in this matter that I give you when I say it is profitable and fitting for you now to complete the enterprise, which more than a year ago you not only began, but were the first to wish to do anything about the contributions for the relief of the saints of Jerusalem. Hmm. If you're going to start something, finish it. So many people get excited about, woo, this is going to be great. We're going to get in here. This is going to be done. (sighs) My enthusiasm just left. I don't know if I really want to see this thing through. You know, this great country we live in didn't get built by people who didn't persevere. They, they let me tell you something. (laughs) Today, we got a click of a button. They had these. They persevered. So we got the benefit. We just had Veterans Day. They persevered so we could reap the reward. Imagine if they had the attitude of, well, I know I started this fight, but I'm ready to pack up and go home. Wait a minute. (laughs) Wait a minute, then I won't get a reward. If we don't persevere in this generation, 
our children won't reap a reward. You have, to be, you have to be persistent in that. I will keep on. Dedicated, never given up. The next one, Willie, was integrity. Integrity. Honesty. Doing what is right, even when no one's looking. It's easy to do what's right when people are looking at you. Oh, they're looking. You're doing 65 and a 45, but you see the police officer, you slow right on down. He won't see me speeding because I saw him, see? But when he ain't there, I'm going to hit about 70 again. Because see, he won't be looking at me. Why do you think you have to have someone looking at you to do the right thing? Just do the right thing no matter what. God's always looking at you. He's always knowing. He knows what you're doing all the time. So doing what is right, even when no one is looking. That team, that coach showed integrity by holding up her end of the bargain is saying, young man, you cannot play on this team anymore. See, in the beginning, we made this statement, and everyone agreed. But you broke your word, and I know you're one of the best players, and we need you, but we can't have you right now. That's it. you got to hold up your end of the bargain. Luke 16.10, Willie. Luke 16, 10. Even, yep. 16, 10. Luke 16, 10, yep. He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is dishonest and unjust in a very little thing is dishonest and unjust also in much. Simple principle. Simple principle. You don't want to start on the track of, well, a little Johnny, he lied, but it was just a little lie. Let's fast forward to clock 10 or 15 years later. Well, you know, Johnny lied. It was, a little, it was kind of a bad lie, but, you know, it wasn't that bad. Let's go another 10 years. Whew, boy, Johnny told a whopper of a lie, and now he's in prison. But it was so cute and cuddly when it was a little lie, when it was a little dishonest. Just a little thing. I just wasn't faithful in that little thing. Just a little thing. Honest dealings reveal your character. If you want to be known to be dishonest, it won't take much. <laughs> and you'll be sitting around wondering, I wonder why no one ever calls me to help them, or I wonder why no one ever asks me to be in charge of something. I wonder why, I wonder why, I wonder why. If I displayed that kind of character, I wouldn't be up here. I wouldn't expect Pastor Bob to ask me to even rake a leaf. Not even rake a leaf. Because he knows the principle. If I can't trust you in this little thing, how can I trust you in something big? My brothers and sisters... Never figured out why when my dad finally got to those last stages of his life, he said, Charlie, you just handle it. I'm the youngest of six, y'all. But I displayed this character that I'd take care of the little things, and he saw me taking care of big things. And then it was time to take care of the big thing. There was no debate about it. And that's not honoring me. That's just, I followed the principle. Right. Amen. I just followed the principle. 
I'm not the brightest guy in the room. I just followed the principle. Dishonor that. Proverbs 11.3, Willie. The integrity of the upright shall guide them, but the willful contra- contrariness and crookedness of the treacherous, boy, that's a lot there, shall destroy them. Whew, boy, that's something. <laughs> Dishonesty and deception are a form of bondage because we are always trying to hide our real motives. There is freedom and honesty because it allows forgiveness, vulnerability, Positive change and healing. There's a lot of health in that. Let's see, if I'm dishonest, I'm in bondage. When you lie, you always have to keep up and remember your lie. And that is a heavy burden that you're always carrying. Like a ball and chain, you never can stand up straight. I don't care if you haven't lied 20 years since. You still carrying that thing, you ain't straightened up. And you wonder, why can't I be free? But when you deal with it, and ask for forgiveness, and go to the person if that person's available, and ask for forgiveness. Sometimes that ain't the case, but if you get right with God, you're clear. But if you can straighten it out... Straighten it out so then you can, wow, I feel like a free man now. I carried that thing around for 35 years. I wondered why I never really got to where I needed to be. When you're in bondage, you never get to where you need to be, okay? You might think you're where you need to be. You are never there while you're in bondage. The devil has the rights to the bondage. God has the right to the freedom. You want to serve that devil and stay in bondage? That's where you're going to be. But serve God, be honest, straighten these things out, and be free. Be free with him. The next one they had on their list was leadership. Leadership, guiding and inspiring others, having a positive influence. That one characteristic right there of what those coaches did with that team, God honored them for that. Listen, when you're a coach, you don't want to lose. They didn't enjoy losing. They really wanted to win. But what they were teaching those kids was more important than winning. And out of that, there was such a lesson and a blessing out of that. That watch what I'll do. Y'all think this thing's over. Watch what I'll do. I'm telling you, you would not believe it. This team played phenomenal in this tournament. Everyone was left going, what happened? They didn't know what happened. They could not believe it. But our kids believed it. They were basking in it. They were having a ball. But these coaches' leadership, of what they were instilling in the kids. Just not how to play ball, but teaching them some character and morals. That's what got them there. And that's what God honored. Do not let today's world get you off of your role as a leader. You're either going to teach God's principle to your kids, or you're not. The school can't tell you how to teach your kids at your house. The government can't teach you or tell you how to teach your kids about God. See, so many people have fallen into, well, I'm supposed to be told what I'm supposed to teach. No, you're not. If you're waiting on that, you are losing the war. Because your kids are getting indoctrinated into such a messed up cultural mindset 
well, it's not good to be a leader. See, because leaders usually go out and head of the pack and, you know, they show kind of dominance and that's frowned upon. Well, who's going to lead you then? Who's going to lead you guys? Are one of y'all going to be a leader? Do you know your generation right there? One of you has to be a leader. There's millions of followers for every leader. People are looking for a leader. Someone has to pick up their role and go with it. You have to sometimes... All right, here we go. And if you fail, who cares? So what? But you've got to go forward. You've got to go forward. By the way, I never in my life and volunteered to lead anything. I was always chosen. Never volunteered. Had to say no. Had to learn to say no many times, too. Because that's what a good leader can also do. It's someone else's time. I've done that enough. Let's build someone else up. I was telling the men when I was in banking, I was well respected for what I did. I was a guy who was told you had to have a degree to get into the career. And I got in it without it. Well, you'll never advance to this stage without a degree. And I advanced to that stage. Well, you know, you can't really do these kind of functions. The CEO would ask me to go give a speech. So all the no's was yeses. (laughs) But my biggest accolade, what I was most proud of, there was either four or five of my employees that I encouraged, mentored, led, helped, guided, served, that went on and rose above me, started their own businesses. And my last parting word was, maybe one day I'll have the opportunity to come work for you. To me, that's victory. To me, that's leadership. See, so many people want to keep you there. I know you're good, but if I keep you there, I'll look like the big shot. That ain't no glory in that. I still have a card that one of the young ladies wrote me. It's, you know, I don't keep a lot of cards, but I kept this one. Her gratitude. Charles, you were a good boss, but you were a better mentor and a godly man because you allowed me to explore an opportunity. You encouraged me to do it. And then when it was time, you basically kicked me out the door and told me to go do it. But that's what you got to do as a leader. It's not just about you being the leader. See, because leaders need other leaders. You know, I got to follow somebody. Can't lead everything. Be worn out, fall on the floor dead. (laughs) So you got to build them up. Matthew 20, 26. Not so shall it be among you, but whoever wishes to be great among you, you must be, sorry, to be great among you must be your servant. Good leaders are servants. Good leaders serve people. If you see a leader who's not serving people, that's not a leader. There's a fall coming for that guy (laughs) or that woman. Good leaders serve. They have a servant's heart. Uh, 1 Chronicles 21.8, Willie. 
1 Chronicles 21, 8. And David said to God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing. But now I beseech you, take away the hateful wickedness of your servant. For I have done very foolishly. Wow. Good leaders accept responsibility for their actions. So many times, they'll do the action and then scapegoat. Well, you know, yeah, that happened, but see, it really wasn't me, you know, it was all this other stuff, and no, no. A lot of people will make this claim, the buck stops here, but then when you ask them about the buck, they ain't got no buck. (laughs) They're passing the buck. If you ever hear someone say the buck stops here, I check that person out real good and see their history. Because usually that doesn't match up and line up. If you've got a record of taking responsibility and accountability, you don't have to make statements like that. I don't make statements like that. I don't need to. If I get to where I've got to make statements like that for you to trust me, I've got a problem. <laughs> so, No. Good leaders accept responsibility for their actions. Proverbs 12, 15, Willie. You boys still heard what I said about a leader, right? Looking for some leaders. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who listens to counsel is wise. Mm Mm-hmm. Good leaders have others who hold them accountable. There's a big problem we have with a lot of our politicians, a lot of our leaders. They put these staffs together, but they're not holding them accountable. They're just going with the flow. Just, you just listen to what I say, and if it's wrong, just act like I didn't say it. Listens to good counsel. My um, my friend Charles, who I mentored, and who is my business partner now, I would give him advice along the way, and he followed it and do this. And one time, and I don't even remember what it was, but he came up and he goes, Charles. You gave me advice on something, and I didn't do it. I'll never be that foolish again. There's nothing you would tell me to do that would be hurtful. You would only tell me to do something that would be helpful, and I didn't listen on that one. I will not make that mistake again. He was listening to his heart that make I had wise counsel and did a foolish thing by not listening to wise counsel. He didn't make that mistake again. And he's climbing that ladder, fulfilling his goals, but he listens to wise counsel. Again, I'm not the wise guy in the room, but I listen. I, I know God's principles. It's not rocket science, man. <laughs> it's pretty simple. What these coaches were teaching were not, you know, these, whoo, I mean, theories of, you know, These were simple principles. But they have dire consequences if you do not do them. Why can't I get nowhere? Why is everything wrong? Why doesn't my mate love me? Why doesn't this church function the way I want it to? Why don't? Why? 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 People who don't follow them principles have a lot of whys in their life. The people who follow them have a lot of do's. Here's what I do. Here's what we do. Here's what, how we function. Here's what we do. They don't go around asking why, why, why. They don't get stuck in the mud. So, 
wise counsel. So here we again, we had it, responsibility, respect, good deeds, perseverance, integrity, leadership. This was for a group of 10, 11, and 12-year-olds. It's also wise counsel to 25s, 36s, 42s, 82s. It's wise counsel to every one of us in this room. And if you think you have a dysfunctional life, check your thing against those principles. And if they're not lining up with those principles, do a little reflective surgery on yourself. Man, oh, Lord, I'm not holding up my end of the bargain. Great example is when Miss Susan talks about the pins from the airbase, putting them in your lunch box. Bob, these belong to the United States government. I was at Little Caesars, got us a pizza, and I drove away with the lady's pin, got on the road, turned back around, and brought her pin back. And she looked at me like I was crazy. Well, sir, it's just pin. Yeah, but it's not mine. She looked weird at me. I said, I don't live, I live by a principle that what is my, it's, if it's not mine, it don't belong to me. She couldn't grasp it, but hopefully later it sank into her. Now, that would have been a little thing. But see, if it convicts you, and you don't do what you're supposed to do once it convicts you, then you got trouble. Now, if I'd have drove home and not took that pen, I wasn't going to get struck by no lightning bolt or nothing. But when it convicted me, after I drove off with it, there was no choice but to turn around and take that little big pen, didn't even have a top on it, back to that lady. That was little Caesar's pen, not mine. But you know what? Didn't feel bad inside. Clear. Upright, the little things. My bank entrusted me with millions of dollars over my career. Bigger thing. If I'd have built the reputation on never upholding my end of the bargain on little things, I'd have never been responsible for those big things. And I wouldn't want to be. So we got to get these principles down. we got to fine-tune. And not so much ourselves. I think overall we have it. But see, we got a generation out there. we got children. we got friends. we got neighbors. Now, they ain't walking in this stuff, man. Hey, ain't no big deal. I didn't lie. Yeah, but you kept something that wasn't yours. You're going to be in bondage. Well, you know, I played the, I, I know I played that weekend and I told you I was going out of town, but is it really that big of a deal? Yes, it is that big of a deal. Because you would have brought disgrace onto this team because, see, we honored what we said we would. So I love the fact this all came out of this championship weekend of these 12 year old kids. How does this team, who can only muster up one win before this, with probably eight losses, how could they go in and win the championship tournament? It was not possible. But I know what happened. God honored what those Christian coaches were doing with the bunch of boys that were in a public recreation system and brought a little bit of his light to their lives. And a little bit of that light went out from them kids to those parents of those kids in those stands. And those parents get to tell their friends, hey, we won this championship. Well, how did y'all win? You know, I don't really know, but there's something happened. It all came together. But see, old Charlie back here, Charlie knew when everyone else didn't. 
God showed me just a little glimpse of, watch this, son, watch this. And it was awesome. It was awesome. Right up to the last out of the last game, they were still thinking this is going to fall apart. And I'm like, we're going to win, we're going to win, we're going to win. And I think those boys, if they stay on the track of what these coaches taught them, they will win in life. They will be a success. They won't be the ones when you walk by, you have to, did you hear that kid? Can you believe the way they're talking? They're acting? I'm going to walk over here a little bit because see we've got some young kids. Everything you do is going to affect the rest of your life. Look at me. Everything you do will affect the rest of your life. Everything you don't do will affect the rest of your life. Enjoy yourself, but just keep a little bit in the back of my mind. It'd be better for me to do the right things and reap good rewards than to do a stupid small thing and reap a lifetime of hatred, bitterness, contempt, and why didn't it go my way? It ain't going to sink in tonight, but just think about it. If you ever doubt any of that, call me. We'll talk about it. And I'll go show you some people who thought, I can do what I want, and it doesn't matter. Or I know more than you. Watch what I can do. But their sink, is, their sink uh, ship has sunk. They don't know why. Or they turn to drugs and alcohol to take that pain away, which is causing them more pain. But they're fooled by it. I'm looking at each one of you. I want to see leaders. I want to see men of honor, women of honor and integrity. One day, I have to depend on you guys. I need you guys. I'm not telling you not to have fun. You're kids. But have a little dose of seriousness in there once in a while. Of my actions are going to follow me. When you're behind bars over something ridiculous, it's too late then to stop it. That's a serious thing to say, but that's a serious reaction. That's what happens when you don't care about any of these principles we talked about. Or when you think, well, it's just something small. It really won't matter. I can cheat a little bit, I can tell a little lie. I can do a little something dishonest. God's always on your side. He's always watching. But he will not honor when you disregard his principles. Remember that. Remember that. Now that's Mr. Charles because I love you. Sometimes I'm hard because even though I haven't experienced a lot of that junk, I've got brothers and sisters and relatives who have. I've got friends who they don't know why they can't get off around that mountain. And I can't make them follow the principle. All I can do is share the principles with them and, and show them by my wall. But if they would have come to me, Charles, man, I'm really messing up. Can you help me? Let's do this thing. It's too late (laughs) when they're out of my reach. And even as adults, it's too late. When we, eh, I'll be all right. I don't need no one's help. I got this. Simple principles. You want to win in life? You follow these principles. 
simple. Don't get fooled by, well, what status or position will you gain? Uh -uh. (laughs) Uh-uh. I will lead a clean, free life by following these principles. And I'll be all the happier for it. And God will honor me from that. Thank you.